Good evening. Uh, welcome to this week's podcast where we are looking at chartism. Uh, and specifically, we're looking at the issue of what did the Chartists want? Uh, was it bread and cheese or was it revolution? Um, as we always do, we'll, we'll start with um, an extract and we'll have a look at um, an extract from a book called A Mad, Bad and Dangerous People, written by the historian Boyd Hilton, published in, in 2006. And I think this is a nice way of, of setting up this podcast because um, it, it gets into the whole um, issue as to um, what Chartism was really all about. So Boyd Hilton writes... He asked, well, he actually asked the question, what was Chartism in the first place? It had a loose definition that would sweep in all forms of popular protest. The anti-poor law movement, uh, demonstrations against the new police forces, the revolutionary nationalism of the Newport Rising in South Wales in 1839, an action by small tenant farmers against improving uh, landlords in the Rebecca riots, which took place between 1839 and 1842. Um, and he argues that the nature of Chartism varied from place to place. And there were well over, he says, 1,000 places showing at least some taint of it, as well as more than 120 local newspapers aligned to the cause. Um, so it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting extract because it, it effectively is throwing up the question of, of or the issue of you know, how do you pin Chartism down? Um, was it you know simply about winning the vote, uh, or, or was it to do with more um, broader issues of economic issues such as unemployment, or in this case, as he says. Um, you know, uh, frustration with uh, the anti-poor uh, law movement, and of course the anti uh, the um, the poor law amendment act of 1834. Uh, was it about, as he says, the uh, demonstrations against the new police force, which of course, by certainly by the uh, 1840s, we have the rollout of, of regional police forces throughout the country. So it is. Um, difficult to really pin chartism down and that's the purpose of this podcast to kind of try to uh, to find a way into this debate and whether or not chartism was to, to at least to the rank and file membership uh, a, a political movement that would uh, ensure that the working classes could um, achieve better working conditions that they could put food on the table uh, and a roof over their heads so hence um, bread and cheese or was it as some historians have suggested um, a potential revolutionary movement now um, so with regards to to the causes of chartism um, I just want to speak a, a little bit um, about that so Boyd Hill gives us a nice sort of overview as to what Chartism was in different places to different people. But in terms of trying to identify the factors or causes that, that led to the emergence of Chartism by 1839, I think you know, we, we, can look at, uh, we can look at several things. Um, obviously, um, when you look at the, the key terms of, of the, uh, the six points of the People's Charter, which we'll get to shortly, these are all political demands. Um, and naturally, um, it is uh, absolutely right to make a case that Chartism was politically motivated. It, this was the, you know, the political aspirations of the working classes, and it was due in no small measure to the bitter frustration um, that had occurred as a result of the 
great reform act of 1832 which as we've discussed in, in lessons um, extended uh, the franchise but in such a way that was tied to property and whilst that enfranchise what we would call the middle and upper middle classes um, it completely excluded um, the labouring classes so um, the great reform act of 1832 came as a bitter bitter disappointment um, to the working classes and there's no doubt whatsoever that that was one reason why the people's charter was 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 drawn up but then of course you can look at other factors as well um, I think the question is, you know, what, why did Chartism become such a, um, a widely supported movement? Why did it, why did the petitions to Parliament gain millions of signatures? Why did it have such a, a huge following? And I think, um, as we've already discussed, it, the, the movement represented different things to different people. And there was certainly um, an economic motive to Chartism. Many of the rank and file members had joined the movement simply because they wanted um, better working conditions. So you look at the Factory Act of 1833, um, which again was a source of uh, considerable frustration. And whilst it, you know, um, reduced the working hours of children between the ages of nine to twelve to eight hours a day um, the effect of that of course was to create the relay system in which um, children were there were free shifts free eight hour shifts for children but which necessitated adults working longer shifts working 16 17 hour days so the factory act came as, as, a, as a bitter disappointment for uh, for many workers you then have linked to that of course um, the growing effects of mechanization and industrialization there were the the skilled handloom weavers of course you know, at the beginning of the century had been largely put out of the work uh, by the um, by the factory system by the uh, by the mills they couldn't compete with mass production and mechanization so job security um, well, was a big issue for, for many working men um, you then have the Poor Law um, Amendment Act of 1834, which was seen by, by many as a punishment. It was a punishment-based approach. It, it did nothing to look at the causes of poverty. Um, and, and the workhouse system that it set up um, was incredibly harsh. Uh, in, it, it would split families apart and, and the whole notion of making the workhouses less illegible so the idea was that uh, the conditions of the workhouses should not be um, should not provide better conditions um, that uh, an average family would a would be able to attain through their own endeavors uh, and so it, it for many people it was a measure of last resort and it split families apart and it was seen really as a punishment for being poor it did nothing to address the underlying causes of poverty um you have of course the, the there's no coincidence that in my mind that when you see um chartist agitation building up particularly in and around the time of the free petitions in 1839 and 1842 and 1848, that that coincided with periods of economic slump and, 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 and high unemployment. There was, of course, connected to that, a series of bad harvests, particularly in the late 1830s. And add to that, of course, the corn laws, which was forcing up the price of bread. Um, so all of these, you know, all of these um, issues, a lot of them are economically motivated and a lot of them, um, I believe, are you know, significant factors in, 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 the char in, the, in, the, in the People's Charter being drawn up. Um, you then have also got 
um, the failures of, of the of the trade unions. Uh, so the Combination Acts were repealed uh, in 1824, and, and so it allowed uh, workers to begin to to bargain for for better uh, pay and conditions. But of course, the, the toll pole martyrs, those poor men had 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 been. Um, sent to Australia, deported to Australia for the crime, such as it was of banding together and swearing an oath of allegiance uh, to a union, uh, which of course was deemed um, treasonous. And, um, and and so that, you know, in spite of the uh, development of the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union, um, that came as a bitter blow to uh, to the aspirations of many working men that they would find a voice, a political voice, uh, through the trade union system. And of course, the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union had all but folded by August of 1834. So that's uh, another factor to, to consider when we, when we look at the, uh, the reasons behind the emergence of, of, of Chartism. There's then also, um, there is a wider European dimension to this as well. And that's, that is important um, to, to bear in mind that there was revolutionary movements going on all over Europe and whether or not Chartism was, was connected to that is a very interesting question. Um, now, some working knowledge, of course, of, of 19th century Europe would be really useful in being able to, to understand the wider context of of what was going on. So um, in 1830 and 1831, the map of Europe looked very different to what it does today. So uh, Germany was not, for example, a country, a united country um, as it is today, but it was a, a confederation of uh, many independent states, of course, the largest of which was Prussia. Uh, in 1830, there had been uh, a series of uprisings in many of the German states, such as Hanover and, and, and Saxony, Saxony, I beg your pardon, where you know there was some attempt to establish some type of loose liberal constitution. Um, uh, but these efforts, of course, uh, it didn't really last. Um, there was um, another revolution in France. Um, in, in 18, uh, between 1830 and 1831. So the uh, July Revolution uh, in France in 1831 was um, the culmination of opposition to the rule um, of Charles X. Um, <clears throat> and so there was a, a general uprising of workers and students in Paris uh, again who demanded you know, greater participation in the political process and, uh, and, uh, and the establishment of a constitution. Um, and that eventually led to the abdication of, of King Charles II and the uh, Chamber of Deputies proclaimed uh, Louis Philippe King of the French on the 9th of August. So, yeah, there was another revolution in France. Uh, there was uh, major flashpoints in the Italian kingdoms. Italy didn't exist as a single political entity as it does today. And the northern Italian kingdoms were very much dominated by the Austrian Empire. Um, and this was very much connected to, to what had happened uh, in France. Um, now, Uh, so the question is, all of this was, was, was this political agitation, a series of flashpoints and potential revolutions and, you know, uh, and regime changes in Europe. Was Chartism, um, or can we link Chartism to the political upheavals that were taking place uh, on the continent? Um, and that's something we're going to come back to, because as we'll see in, in 1848, during the time of the third Chartist petition, uh, there was all hell uh, breaking loose uh, in Europe at the time. Um, 
So that's really the debate, isn't it? Um, was Chartism politically motivated? Was it potentially revolutionary? Um, or was it more about working people trying to you know, establish better pay, better working conditions and bread and cheese on the table? Um, so let's have a look at some, some differing perspectives. So I'm going to uh, just go through uh, uh, some sources with you, um, which would um, give us an insight into so perhaps the uh, the different motivations or, or the different factors which underpinned the emergence of Chartism. So let's look at people's living conditions, first of all. Um, now, of course, before we do that, you know, if we're talking about, if we are, you know, if we are saying that Chartism was was more about bread and cheese and and, and living conditions and, and and better pay and better working conditions, then obviously the reason the, the Charter was drawn up and the demands that were made, as we'll see, such as the right to vote for every man over twenty one, the right for working men to win peace, the idea is that the um, working class aspirations, economic aspirations, better pay, better working conditions would never be realised in a parliament in which working people had no voice. So you can only begin to affect change um, when you gain a political voice, when you can hold the government to account. So a parliament comprised as it was mostly of the aristocracy still increasingly the sort of more uh, entrepreneurial and business classes of the the MPs that were that had made um, significant strides up the social ladder coming from these more commercial um, backgrounds by virtue of the industrial revolution but nevertheless, this was still a parliament dominated by manufacturers, dominated by the landed aristocracy. So they are not going to enact legislation to benefit the labouring classes. The only way that the labouring classes could force a parliament into legislating for working class interests is if working class people could participate in that system. And that parliament was accountable to working class interests and the only way that was going to happen was for working people to be able to vote and for working people to be able to become members of parliament. So that's just an important point to make there I think. So although chartism, you know, when we look at the six points of the charter, these are all political points. It, the idea is that by enfranchising working people, by allowing people to participate in elections to al by allowing working men to become members of parliament would ensure that working class interests were addressed in parliament. So let's have a look at, um, I'm going to read you an extract from a report on the city of Newcastle made by Dr. D.B. Reed in 1845, so three years before the final petition. And this was submitted to the Newcastle Corporation. And he wrote, the streets most densely populated by the humble, humbler classes are a mass of filth where the direct rays of the sun never reach. In some of the courts I have noticed heaps of filth amounting to 20 or 50 tons, which when it rains, penetrate into some of the cellar dwellings. A few public necessaries, public toilets have been built, but too few to serve the population. A room was noticed with scarcely any furniture and in which there were two children of two and three years of age, absolutely naked, except for a little straw to protect them from the cold. The absence of dustbins was everywhere a cause of great annoyance, and no such activity horrified me more than the attempt to keep the refuse of privies for the purpose of selling it to neighbouring farmers. Well, that's pretty grim, isn't it? 
how strains where they exist have not been constructed properly and often become choked. In numerous dwellings, a whole family shares one room. The lodging houses for the extreme poor present the most deplorable examples. They are badly crowded, dirty, badly managed, ill-ventilated, where the sexes mix without control. The most intolerable nuisance is certainly one resulting from a slaughterhouse in the very centre, just off the most fashionable part of town. And in the presence of great quantities of animal matter, the offal of beasts is left to rot until liquid streams run down high flyer lane. So this is, you know, a pretty grim window into the habitations of working class families in a major city like Newcastle in the 1840s. And it's no exaggeration to say that the same sordid story wouldn't be true in Leeds or London or Sheffield or other major highly populated industrial centres. So the long-term effects of industrialization and urbanization had created vast overcrowding, poor quality housing and destitution. And I think we need to at least partly locate the emergence of Chartism in the context of the squalid, awful living conditions that working people found themselves in. It is also worth bearing in mind, of course, the terms of the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834. So this radical shaking up of the Poor Law, the existing Poor Law provisions that had been in place since Elizabethan times, as we mentioned earlier, was seen by many working people as simply a punishment for being poor. Um, so, if you recall, outdoor relief, so financial assistance for the old and infirm, continued, but outdoor relief was abolished, abolished I beg your pardon, for the able-bodied worker. From that point on, the only relief available to an able-bodied man and his family was in a workhouse. And conditions in the workhouses were, as we mentioned previously, were to be made less illegible than those of the lowest paid labourers in work. And this is the principle of less illegibility. So the government of the time didn't want to, uh, working people to see the workhouse as something, oh, wow, well, actually, I can, you know, if I go in a workhouse, I'm going to get a better deal here. We're going to, you know, end up with better living conditions and better food. So the idea was that they would be um, made, I guess, uh, deliberately, um, deliberately harsh. So they, they were really only a measure of, of last resort. Um, and of course, as we know, they established seven classes of pauper or poor people who were to be kept separate within the workhouse. And so they divided them into men that were infirm due to age or illness, able-bodied men and boys over 15, boys between 7 to 15, women, elderly women who were infirm through age or women who were infirm through illness, uh, able-bodied women and girls over 15, girls aged 7 to 15 and children under 7. So as we know they had their hair shaved off, they were given these awful, awful um, uniforms to wear, um, they had very little contact with the rest of their family, they had to eat their meals in silence, punishments in the workhouse were commonplace. So for many poor people these workhouses were little more than prisons or bastilles and so I think that's another important context in establishing why Chartism emerged. Um, 1834 the Charter was drawn up in 1839 one would see a correlation there. Um, we've already mentioned the Factory Act no children under nine were to work. Children aged nine to twelve 
who work no more than eight hours a day. The young people aged 13 to 18 were to work no more than 12 hours a day. Um, and as we know, what this did, it created, it set up the relay system, which the knock-on effect of that was that adults would end up working longer hours, 16, 17, 18 hour days. The last extract I'm going to read is from the novel Sybil by the future British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. This was published in 1846. Disraeli would go on to become Prime Minister of, of Britain in 1874. And this is the, an extract from his novel. And it reads, this is a new reign, said Egram, perhaps a new era. But say what you like, our Queen rules over the greatest nation that ever existed. In which nation, asks the young stranger, for she reigns over two, between whom there is no intercourse and no sympathy. You speak of, said Egremont, hesitatingly, the rich and the poor, the aristocracy of England, form at this moment the most prosperous class that the history of the world can furnish. It stands before Europe the most gorgeous of existing spectacles, and it governs the most miserable people on the face of the globe. So, that's another factor, isn't it? The vast inequalities that existed between those at the top of the social hierarchy and those at the bottom. Britain had become the most wealthy, powerful nation in the world, but very little of that wealth was trickling down to those at the bottom. Um, and it, we're talking really about a grotesquely unfair, unregulated, free market capitalist system. And the only way, of course, for working people to do anything about that would be to have a voice inside Parliament. So, how did the Chartist movement begin? Well, simply put, in 1836, a London Working Men's Association uh, was formed, put together by a group of London artisans, skilled workers and trade unionists, as a, as a, a response, of course, to the bitter disappointment that came with the um, 1832 Reform Act. Um, the secretary of the association was William Lovett, who, of course, would be one of the moral force leaders of, of Chartism. The treasurer was Henry Hebrington, who was also a printer uh, and a publisher. Um, so in 1837, this London Working Men's Association presented a petition to Parliament calling for electoral reform. Now, a small number of radical MPs also showed uh, an interest in this, and six MPs and six members of the association redrafted the petition as a parliamentary bill, so as a proposed law. Um, in May of 1838, the draft was published under the title The People's Charter, giving the Charter's movement, of course, its name. Now, this was a deliberate play, of course, on the Great Charter or Magna Carta that was drafted by the barons way back in 1215. That had 63 points. The People's Charter simply had six. So let's have a look at the, um, the six points of this People's Charter. Number one, of course, was a vote for every man over 21 years of age, of sound mind and not undergoing punishment for any crime. So in other words, universal adult male suffrage. Not women voters, not at this point. The next demand was for a secret ballot. So um, voting, of course, was done publicly on the hustings. And as a result, the people that were allowed to vote could be bribed and, and intimidated. So being able to vote in secret was seen as a, a, an essential, uh, uh, was seen to be you know, essential in, in underpinning a fair election. If people could vote secretly, 
um, then they could cast their vote for whoever they wanted. They wouldn't be forced or pressured into voting for someone they didn't want to vote for. The third demand was for the abolition of the property qualification for MPs. And that links in to the fourth demand, which was payment for MPs. And what these two demands would do, of course, was would be to allow ordinary men of modest means to, put, to run as members of parliament. Being an MP uh, at that point was predicated on owning property. And for working men to be MPs, of course, that had to change. But it was also really important that um, working men were paid because being an MP is a full-time job. It's an expensive job. So a salary was, was uh, required. Um, equal numbers of electors in all constituencies. So even in spite of the Reform Act of 1832, which done away with most of the rotten boroughs, um, not all constituencies were equal. Um, some constituencies were still massively overrepresented for their populations. And some constituencies, particularly the big industrial centres, were still significantly underrepresented. So that had to change. And the last demand, of course, was for um, annual parliaments. Now, that really means um, an election every year. Um, now, we'll come back to, uh, um, in a moment, um, what became of these six demands and when they were, were realised. Um, but in terms of the Chartist leadership, um, the, the big theme that, that's really important is, of course, the division in Chartist aims. So you had a significant part of the leadership that were known as moral force Chartists. And that was people, of course, like um, William Lovett and Elizabeth Peace, um, Henry Hetherington. These, uh, you know, these leaders believed that Chartism that, that should be a peaceful and legal organisation. It should seek to achieve its aims through speeches and pamphlets and newspapers to demonstrate that the working class voter was responsible. And on the other hand, you had the physical force chartists. These were the guys that um, believed that um, violence was justified, that militancy was justified, that the, the, the chartists would have to use some type of force if they were to achieve their aims. And it's these chartists that the government really feared. And it's these chartists that give rise to the question, how revolutionary was chartism? Was it simply about bread and cheese? Or was it more about violent revolution? Now, the um, probably the most famous of the physical force chartists was Fergus O'Connor, um, who ironically run the Northern Star, the Chartist newspaper. Um, but he had uh, made, um, well, actually, he was imprisoned for publishing seditious material in 1839, and he made no secret of his desire for Chartism to, to flex its muscles and to become perhaps um, more violent if it was to, uh, to achieve its means. So there was a division within the Chartist leadership of, of, of how the People's Charter uh, was to be achieved. Um, and many people, many historians have, have cited that as a potential reason for why the, the Chartist movement failed in, in the longer term, because there was a, um, you know, for any organisation to be successful, everyone has to be, you know, on the same page as it were, everyone has to be pulling in the same direction. And if you're not doing that, if there are factions and divisions, then chances are that organisation, you know, in whatever walk of life, you know, is not going to be successful. 
Um, okay, so what you need to know, of course, was that there were three petitions. The, the, the six points of the People's Charter was put before Parliament on three occasions. Um, 1839 uh, being um, the first time. Now, in February of that year, uh, the National Chartist Convention met in London to organise a petition to Parliament. Um, now, straight away, because of the divisions and the leadership, um, there was um, a significant split between, of course, those who wanted to induce a general strike. In other words, to encourage workers all over the country to down tools. Uh, and of course, those who wanted to achieve the p a petition through um, legal means. Uh, in June of that year, the first petition had gathered over a million signatures. And it was presented to Parliament uh, by uh, Thomas Atwood, um, who, of course, was uh, a leader of the uh, Birmingham Political Union. Um, so he was... Um, a very significant member of the Chartist leadership. Now, the petition was roundly rejected in Parliament by 235 votes to just 46. Um, the response to that from the physical force Chartists was to organise what they called a sacred month. This was a general strike along with protests and demonstrations. Um, <clears throat> so how did the government respond to that? Um, the army was increased in numbers and perhaps more importantly, new regional police forces were set up in cities such as Birmingham, Manchester, Bolton and other large city centres. Many Chartist leaders were arrested as a result of that. So it's quite interesting when you look at the history of our police force, a lot, a lot of the regional forces came into effect because of the perceived threat that Chartism posed to the establishment. Now, with these Chartist leaders being arrested um, as a result of these protests and strikes and demonstrations, in November of 1839, this led to an event known as the Newport Rising. And this was an attack on the town by 5,000 miners. And it was led by a Chartist called John Frost. And the aim of this was to release a Chartist from jail. He'd been put in jail in Newport uh, as a result of the police and government crackdown on Chartist strike action. Um, about 20 Chartists were killed as a result of this, and Frost was, he, first he was sentenced to death, um, but he was later uh, transported uh, to, to Australia. So what we see, we see with, with the first petition, it was peaceful enough to start with, but when it was rejected and roundly rejected by Parliament, uh, things got nasty quite quickly. Uh, and it did appear to the establishment at the time that this was a serious revolutionary movement that needed to be very closely watched. And of course, it necessitated an expansion in the army, in the size of the army, and the rolling out of regional police forces. Now, the second petition was put before Parliament in 1842. Um, and this time... Uh, a second Chartist Convention got together. A second petition, this second petition was said to be over six miles long and, we wrote, and had over three million signatures and it was carried down to Parliament in a procession of over 100,000 people. It was presented to the House of Commons by Thomas Duncan and John Fielding. Yet again, as in 1839, the Parliament, the uh, Parliament rejected the petition by 287 votes to just 49. So once again, it was roundly defeated in Parliament. 
So that was in May in the spring. A few months later in the summer of 1842, um, a series of industrial agitation began known commonly as the plug riots. So what was happening is that many workers went on strike as a result of this and they removed the plugs from factory boilers to prevent steam engines from working, uh, which of course basically forced the factories to close. And now the, this was, you know, the makings really of a general strike. And the whole air, the industrial area of the north was, was really brought to a virtual standstill. As a result, I mean, there was also, in addition to that, I should say, there was widespread rioting in cities and towns and cities such as Preston, Rochdale, Stockport, Bolton, Bury, uh, and food shops were even looted in Manchester. Now, of course, Peel uh, was in power at the time. Um, he, his government responded very promptly. Troops were mobilised in the trouble spots. Uh, using, of course, the new railway system, which allowed the army to get up and down the country far more quickly. Hundreds of Chartist leaders were arrested this time, and order was promptly restored. So we, even uh, we might look back with our 21st century eyes and, you know, and wonder what all the fuss was about and why, why did the authorities, why were they so scared of Chartism? But um, at the time, uh, this was a movement that was about revolution. This was not about improving working conditions or bread and cheese. This was clearly a, a revolutionary movement. Now, as time has passed, of course, we perhaps, you know, can um, employ a, a, with the benefit of hindsight, we can perhaps see that that wasn't necessarily the case. No, and not all of the Chartist movement was engaged in this type. Now, lastly, we have the petition, the final petition of 1848. And, and this is where some context of what was going on in Europe is key. So I've already mentioned briefly some of the revolutions that were occurring um, in Europe in 1830 and 1831. But in 1848, everything in Europe seemed to be kicking off. It's one of those years where so much was going on. So I'll just give you a, a quick summation. So um, where are we? Yeah, so um, there was another uprising in Germany, in, in, in the German Confederation. Um, so revolts had uh, broken, broken out in uh, many of the southern states of what we today call Germany. Um, there was a revolt in March of 1848 in Cologne. Um, and by the uh, latter part of March in 1848, there were widespread riots and demonstrations in Berlin. And around 250 demonstrators were killed. Again, as in 1830, many, there were many demands for a liberal constitution. Um, and the king of um, Prussia, Frederick William, a promised an elected assembly, elected by uh, manhood suffrage. It meant once, but was promptly dissolved. So nothing really came to pass there. There was another revolution in France. Of course there was. There's always revolutions in France. Um, so the, the upshot of that was that uh, there had been considerable dissatisfaction with the regime of uh, Louis-Philippe. And in November of 1848, um, after days and days of savage fighting in Paris, uh, a new constitution was drawn up, uh, which provided for the first time for a directly uh, elected president by all adult males. So we see the emergence of the, the fall of the monarchy and the emergence of the Second French Republic. OK, and the first president was Louis Napoleon, who, of course, was the nephew of the emperor. Napoleon um, and he becomes the first president so a, a, a massive massive uh, revolution in France um, the Pope believe it or not was overthrown um, in the Vatican in the Papal States but he was promptly restored 
This is in the Italian kingdoms. Again, crucial point, Italy is not a, a single united country this time, it's five separate kingdoms. Um, in Northern Italy, liberal constitutions were also granted in Piedmont and Tuscany, uh, which led to the formation of the Kingdom of Northern Italy in March of 1839, and a republic was also proclaimed in Venice. Now, at this point, Northern Italy, of course, was, was dominated and ruled over by Austria. Um, and eventually, the Austrians um, are able to reoccupy Milan, and then gradually gain control of northern Italy, and that wouldn't change until Gary Baldi's march on Rome, much, much later. So that's just a taste of what was going on in Europe in 1848. It was an explosive situation, so that is very important content when we look at the Chartists' third petition in 1848. Was it linked to the revolutions that were breaking out all over Europe at the time? Certainly, the government at the time believed that it was. Okay, so in April of 1848, the Second Chartist National Convention um, dropped. They, they, they uh, reduced the six points to to five. The secret, the demand for the secret ballot was dropped. This petition, apparently signed by six million people, and a mass demonstration was planned for Kennington Common, and from there, a mass procession to Westminster. Some of the speakers were urging revolution. Now, how did the government respond to this? Well, troops were stationed at key points around London. Around 150,000 special constables were sworn in. So there was a massive military presence, a massive police presence. Queen Victoria was evacuated from London to go to the Isle of Wight. In the end, it all was a bit of a damp squib. Um, the meeting on Kennington Common went ahead. But there were no massive crowds as such. In fact, there is a photograph of this meeting. It was, uh, again, photography was um, a very recent development. So it is one of the original news photographs that was ever taken. Many historians have speculated it was a miserable day, a cold April day, and the, perhaps the weather put people off from, um, from attending. Um, the petition uh, was actually found to contain actually fewer than 2 million signatures uh, and many of the signatures were actually forgeries. Even Queen Victoria had apparently signed the petition. So um, a lot is made that the, well, the third and final petition, um, although the government feared a mass uprising, it, it was probably less significant than the petitions of 1839 and, and 1830, 1842. Now, after that time, owing to Peel, a lot of Peel's economic reforms, particularly the repeal of the Corn Laws, the economy begins to pick up. And by 1851, we're talking about a mid-Victorian boom. There's the uh, exhibition at the Crystal Palace, which is, you know, um, showing off Britain's preeminence as, as the first in industrial nation. Um, and it's no surprise that when economic conditions improve, Chartism faded away. Um, but that's not to say that Chartism was a failure. All but one of the people's chart, all the, but one of the demands of the people's charter was was eventually met. Okay, it would take until 1918 for all men over the age of 21 to be given the vote. But 1867, skilled working men in the towns were given the vote. 1884, um, men in the counties were given the vote on the same terms as men in the boroughs. Um, that wasn't all men, of course, and it wouldn't be until after the First World War that all men were given the vote. A secret ballot was introduced in 1872, 
The property qualification for MPs was abolished in 1858. Payment of MPs was finally realised in 1911. Um, there was a significant redistribution of, of seats that led um, to fairer constituencies from 1885. Now, of course, we've never had annual parliaments. The reason for that being, of course, that although it would hold the government far more accountable, um, it would be very difficult for a, a government to fulfil its mandate and to do its business within a calendar year. So we've never had annual parliament. It's a great idea, but perhaps it will never work in practice. But what we have seen, of course, is that in 1911, under the terms of the Parliament Act, the uh, duration of a parliament was reduced from seven years to five years. Um, now, we now have a Fixed Term Elections Act, which, which stipulate that our parliament must um, last for five years. But even that we've seen, you know, in recent times, a snap election in 2017, an early election in 2019. So perhaps we're closer to realising that charter's objective than we might think. So, where do you stand? on the issue of this podcast. What was Chartism really all about? Was it about violent revolution? Uh, or was it about bread and cheese? And were working class people really um, pushing for uh, their right to participate in elections so as to make Parliament more accountable so that Parliament would enact legislation that would improve the economic and working life of the labouring classes. I'm going to leave you with that thought as we finish the podcast and hopefully when you look at the balance of the evidence you'll be able to arrive at a judgement of your own. Bye for now.